Thanks, everybody. Uh, unfortunately, we are in the business of uh, covering the dire topics sometimes, but I can say without uh, being melodramatic that every officer I know starts their day, particularly if they're working day shift, thinking about what if the unthinkable happens today? Am I prepared? Are we all prepared? And when we talk about the unthinkable, the, the thing that troubles us the most but that we are most committed to is uh, ensuring the, the safety of our kids, our teachers, <coughs> our staff members, and visitors. So. Um, I can say very honestly that in the, uh, the days after the Sandy Hook incident, uh, we were troubled uh, in a most profound way. We had all watched uh, various incidents unfold over time. I remember exactly where I was watching Columbine happen on live TV during a school break, uh, working day shift and, and watching things happen on television. And it seems like after each one of these incidents, we would put our heads together sometimes informally, sometimes as formal working groups, especially of officers who are uh, more oriented toward the schools, talking about what went wrong, what can we do better. Uh, I think the unspeakable shock of, of seeing elementary school children killed uh, pushed us harder and uh, in a just more gut-wrenching fashion than, than anything in my career. Uh, we had all been uh, believing that the, the lockdown system, while it had some advantages, uh, was possibly not up to, uh, to snuff, and uh, when, uh, when the Connecticut incident happened, we were really convinced at that point that, that something needed to change. Uh, a couple of weeks after that, I was the first uh, of all of our officers to uh, attend training by a company called Response Options. This is a company not without controversy. They have been seen on, uh, on uh, national media. Uh, they're out of Texas, uh, and they, uh, teach this uh, system called ALICE. Uh, unfortunately, a very small component of the program is the one that is most often seen sensationalized on TV. So I went to the, the training with some trepidation uh, because of this reputation for, for some sensationalism, but came away uh, very pleased to know that these folks had thoroughly researched uh, school emergencies and uh, also pleased but, but somewhat embarrassed to find that not only was this private organization uh, advocating uh, a more flight-based response to, to school emergencies, particularly school shooters, but that the Department of Homeland Security had uh, officially uh, recommended the same thing, as had the FBI, the uh, school departments and police departments of uh, New York City and Los Angeles, among others. So uh, we were embarrassed to find that our own professional networks had not brought us up to date, but this was in essence a national standard now by way of uh, the Department of Homeland Security. Um, the ALICE program, uh, just because people will often say, what the heck does ALICE stand for? Uh, and, and it doesn't necessarily happen in this, in this uh, sequence, but just so you'll know, uh, ALICE stands for Alert, Lockdown, Inform, Counter, evacuate. In reality, evacuate at the bottom of the acronym or at the end of the acronym is the most important aspect. So what we're talking about is evacuation being the first best option. And interestingly, shockingly, if anyone's been following the news today, um, in Ottawa uh, there was an active shooter incident uh, in the, the seat of government in Canada, very unusual. Uh, and I was just watching some more footage just before coming here and seeing indeed that they were following the evacuate everyone that you can. Uh, and if not possible, uh, other options. So the reason I, I am mentioning this, uh, what we're doing right now might be uh, called Alice of Light. The, the, the full Alice program, the full Monty, the full Alice, uh, uh, requires some things that we're not quite prepared to do. Some of it has to do with, uh, with architecture. Uh, in, in the perfect uh, Alice setting, we would be encouraging everyone who can flee to flee but the one additional component that Alice has that we're not ready to implement is the inform piece where uh, a teacher or administrator can go to a hardened location, basically a bulletproof place, uh, watch cameras throughout the school, see what's going on, be able to identify the location of a shooter, and be able to inform people over the public address system, bad guys on the third floor, well, I have a third floor at the tech, you know, bad guys on the third floor west end, so everybody else can go, oh, great, I'm not on the third floor at the west end, I can definitely get out of here and, and not be too concerned. We're not prepared to do that yet from an architecture standpoint, and it's complex. So, quite frankly, uh, the, the day after Sandy Hook, as so often happens, we convened a, uh, crisis team meeting at the tech and we also convened a crisis team at the police department saying 
what if this happens in our town today? We felt pretty comfortable with the, the police response part, but we did do some tweaking as a result of things that we had just tragically learned from Sandy Hook. Um, and then the question arose, again, are we really comfortable with the lockdown? No, we're really not. Uh, so we really felt that it was necessary to have an interim available immediately. And immediately, as we all know, is, is not always the easiest thing to achieve. Uh, so the Department of Homeland Security has a, a simplified, and we would like to think an interim plan, which is really what we're following now. So we kind of jokingly are saying we're doing Alice of Light, or uh, w what we can use that's very simple to remember is the uh, Department of Homeland Security's uh, mantra, which is run, hide, fight. Again, not without controversy. I think pretty much everyone is comfortable with the idea that if either an alert is put out over the public address system or heaven forbid someone hears gunshots in the school or uh, someone is running down the hall yelling, you know, there's a person with a gun in the building or lockdown or whatever they might do to, to gain attention, I, I think we're all reasonably comfortable with the thought we would like our kids and our, our staff members to get the heck away from that person. Um, so, uh, so definitely that is our, our primary objective. So the Homeland Security model is simple, run if you can. If you can't, we're not saying that lockdown is, is not an option, we're just saying it's, it's no longer considered the first best option. So as, as a result of possibly someone being in close proximity to a shooter, and, and we actually I was watching this in Canada today, uh, the people who could get away who weren't in close proximity to the shooter were indeed getting out, and fortunately they had a lot of people, public safety people there to help rapid evacuation. Um, if people are in close proximity to the bad guy, then lockdown may be uh, their best option. They don't want to run out of a classroom into a hallway and, and collide with a bad guy. So as part of this program, we're going to be teaching people how to practice an enhanced lockdown, how to do a more effective and better lockdown, not just close the door and lock the door and get away from the door, but also how to potentially barricade the door. And I know it sounds simple, but uh, some things people haven't necessarily thought about is simply the way the door opens. If it opens in, it's, it's actually to your advantage. If it opens out, there are some other strategies you have to practice to make that door, render that door unopenable by a bad guy. And, uh, the, and here's the controversy piece, the fight or resist or whatever you want to call it piece. Uh, and, and many of you have probably seen this on TV where we have pint-sized kids throwing books at some scary looking person in a drill. <coughs> First of all, I want to assure you that it is not our intention to terrify kids or staff members in a drill. And yet we do feel it's necessary to talk to everybody about the fact that if someone is trying to harm them uh, and no other option is available, <coughs> that it is not unreasonable for a person to resist. So most of all, please know that we will not be teaching kids some strange martial art uh, that they can learn in five minutes and, uh, and be utterly safe. But instead we're saying even small kids, if they are running down a hall and encounter a bad guy and all run into said person at the same time and all grab a piece of said person and assist him to the floor, uh, that, that can be done. And some of the training, uh, very interesting training that we did with the, the red man suits, the, kind of uh, Michelin man suits, um, really hurts when four or five kids grab you and assist you to the floor very quickly. Uh, and it doesn't matter how big you are, if, uh, if enough people grab a piece of you and decide that they're going to help gravity get you to the floor, uh, and then even worse, sit on you once you're there, um, it, it is a, a viable option. Uh, going back to the, the enhanced lockdown issue too, we're, we're saying to people if you're stuck in a room because you think the bad guy's right out there and you've piled stuff in front of your room or you've tied off your door closed or made it very difficult for a bad guy to get in, if that person manages to get head and shoulders into the room and they start getting hit with blunt objects in the head, we've said to kids, uh, it's the one day in school you will not get in trouble for this. Please do not do this on any other day, but if, <laughs> for some terrible reason a bad person is trying to hurt you. Fill in the blank, hit him with a fill in the blank. So, um, so that is the, the controversial aspect. It's certainly not the part that we are, are emphasizing most. We're trying to say, because you do occasionally talk to young men in particular who decide this would be a great opportunity to be heroic, and we're, we're underscoring with everybody. Running is good, running is very good. Walking briskly is good. Uh, most of all, we want to evacuate if at all possible. So we're in that interim phase right now of, of implementing run, hide, fight as, uh, as a usable strategy for today and we would be looking in the future to enhancing that to, uh, to even buck up the, the safety level for all concerned. But uh, good news, uh, 
you folks have been very busy, obviously, uh, blending districts uh, during that time. We have managed to use uh, Cape Cod Tech and the Lighthouse Charter as guinea pigs. Uh, I, they probably wouldn't like that term. Uh, and have had uh, some very successful exercises with them uh, emptying the Lighthouse Charter School in under two minutes and emptying the tech in a little over two minutes. Uh, one thing that really struck me, and, and I keep saying it over and over again, and if you've heard it from me before, I, I apologize. but. Uh, as I say, I, I went to my first instructor class with response options still in a bit of a state of shock and the instructor very early on posed the rhetorical question. Uh, he, he first went around the room and asked, people, how many people in your school, how many people in your school? Points at me, how many people in your school? I said approximately 700. He said, how can one person control 700 people? And like Mickey the Dunn said, ah, ah, you know, not having an answer. And he said, the answer is, one person can't control 700 people if we don't let them. We have to get into our mindset today, one person, two people cannot control 700 people. And that is really the, the whole basis of this whole thing here, is that if, if we can act with audacity, we have a better chance of getting our kids, our teachers, our staff members, our visitors out in one piece. Uh, and I would just throw in that the police response uh, continues to be refined. We continue to train our officers. We continue to improve our equipment. We don't want people to feel that you are being orphans because you know <laughs> we're we're coming up with an alternative here. We just want to give you the very best uh, that we possibly can under any circumstance. We want to train. We want to be well prepared, and then we all want to retire happily, having never used any of it, but prepared if, heaven forbid, something should happen. Did I miss anything, Sarge? Thank you very much. Um, Any questions? Sharon. Um, I don't think, uh, when you come in for training, this is with the teachers and the children? We're and is it how many hour training is it? We're starting with the teachers, uh, taking approximately an hour to familiarize them uh, with the concepts. Uh, from there, the teachers will be meeting individually with their resource officer, looking at their own rooms and uh, learning primary and secondary evacuation routes and a number of other uh, things that, that are specific to each teacher, their room, their kids. Uh, we will be having the parent forum. Uh, so basically, this week and next, we're, we're getting to all the teachers and all the schools in system. Uh, parent forum, and then that will be followed by training with the kids. Uh, and the ultimate goal, uh, as soon as we can implement it, will be to conduct a live drill in each of the schools. And uh, as I say, <coughs> thankfully, we have a couple of drills under our belt. Uh, we have let people know right up front that we're not going to do scary things. We're not going to have simulated scary people. There will be no uh, firing of blanks or any of these things that, again, have been somewhat controversial and I think counterproductive. Uh, Kids will know, uh, definitely staff will know, but we're uh, assuring kids that they will know the day that a drill is going to happen. There will, there will be no, no games played with them. And we're asking everyone in the first drill to concentrate on moving swiftly, but not having a stampede. And I was pleasantly surprised the, the kids at the charter school even were able to, to give us a little extra something. We did some evacuation at a first floor window, had, had a couple of volunteer kids, firefighters on the other side to catch them. Uh, just showing that if you got stuck in a room, you might evacuate out of the room if there was an exterior, exterior window, that kind of thing. So, um, so that's the, uh, all of the training is, is leading up to a first drill, which will, we hope, become a regular part of our year just as fire drills are. So uh, in the future, after the classroom, would there be other drills about if they were in the cafeteria or other locations? Ideally, um, in the long run, it is good to, to work up to that, indeed. Uh, and frankly, the evacuation drills from large public open spaces, I feel a lot more comfortable about than when we're having people hunker down in those spaces. Sadly, when you look at the casualties in some of these incidents, uh, the large open public spaces were not good places to hide. Um, and uh, so, uh, so, indeed, Long term, we would like to incrementally make the drills a little more complicated and address every conceivable issue, you know, as we go along. Um, I really like the way you're um, talking about the planning of this and giving people um, some idea of what will be happening, starting with the teachers first, do it, not stampeding, those type of things. But, I mean, I remember when I was a child, we would be under our desks because 
of something, air raids or something. And so there's always been, and even more today, things that are scary. I do think we have to prepare for them and not be victims. So I appreciate that. Thank you. And if I might just add to that, you know, we, we have people who sometimes will say in a public meeting, this is scary. Sometimes they'll sidle up to you and say, I'm really scared. And I think, as always, the thing we try to reinforce with the staff, but also with the kids, is we are in this together. We're not going to leave anyone behind. We're not going to stop training. We're not going to stop talking, explaining, until we feel like everyone knows what their part is. And, uh, of course, we're very happy to be in the schools, and we thank you for allowing us into the schools to work as partners in, in keeping the kids safe. Prior to coming to the Cape, I had, uh, I had been part of a, an Alice sort of overview with superintendents. I believe it was part of the NEMLAC, uh, it was the regional law enforcement agency that was sort of introducing Alice to the western suburbs. And, uh, and there was one analogy that I, I think struck a chord with me. And, uh, and the sad reality of our society is that there are wolves. And, um, and what we had been doing with sort of a traditional lockdown approach is training people to be sheep, you know, to, you know, to sort of be passive in the corner of a room. And, and unfortunately, the, the wolves knew that we were sheep. And, and I really think that what the, what the Alice approach is to, <coughs> is to train our staff to understand that there are options. And, and ultimately to train our staff to become sheepdogs and, and you know, to, you know, to you know, when flight is the right thing, you know, flight you know, and to evacuate. And, and at least in terms of my vision of where I'd like to see our drills get to you know, this year is you know, to, you know, to practice this evacuation. Uh, but I've also shared with the police, uh, you know, I want to go that step further because uh, from experience, evacuation is one thing. Getting our children back to their families is a very is a is an order of magnitude you know, more challenging. And to uh, you know to practice that evacuation to a site, and then to sort of work you know kind of conduct a little tabletop exercise on okay you know if we have everyone here, you know, how do we get our kids back home? Because you can imagine that you know, any of these challenging. Situations. There are you know, parents that, uh, in today's you know, you know, yeah, yeah, information age, you know, the parents are finding out that there's this event that's happened, and they want to reconnect with their children. And how do we make that you know, that happen seamlessly? And, and we have to be prepared as a school to not just get the kids out of the building and safe, but also get them back you know, to their parents and uh, and be able to manage all of that. I, I think of uh, the learning change from in the day we were emphasizing uh, almost the opposites, like uh, athletically there would be a fast break offense run and also slow down. And I think in terms of in a larger school having to evacuate with a barn school fire department and every teacher was mandated to have their rank book and kids would not run out of the building when, once they arrived at site with a teacher hopefully in control there'd be attendance taken and you'd make certain everyone was out, whereas we're now going to say that's fine for that type of a evacuation fire drill. And for an evacuation where run is, teachers have to learn the fact that there's gonna be a whole moment there where it, you're, not, uh, you're not creating a stampede, but on the other hand, uh, it's gonna to be totally different than walking out. Yes, and, and if I may say something to reassure you all, uh, at least <coughs> knock on podium, uh, so far we, we have said to the kids in the, the early drills, I'm sure you're going to be disappointed, guys, but we are only going to go as far as the parking lot because we know you would like to use this as an opportunity to become woodland creatures and <laughs> explore the flora, flora and fauna of Cape Cod. Uh, so we have so far been teaching, in a real emergency, do not stop until you get to the trees, do not stop until you are a football field away, take a second look behind you, are you being pursued, that sort of thing. But for the drills, sorry to disappoint you guys and girls, but uh, we're stopping in the parking lot. So thankfully, again, knock on podium, um, our first drills you know, have, have not been as chaotic as we thought they might, but uh, we'll, we'll try to be um, orderly as we ratchet it up a, a notch at time. Sharon? Do you know if um, with all these agencies, Homeland Security or whatever, that there's been a video game devised that people could use for this to simulate this? 
There's a lot of tabletop exercise equipment. Um, I haven't seen specifically a, a video game. I have uh, participated in a few uh, tabletop uh, exercises that were, were pretty good within the parameters that uh, you know, are available. Uh, the, I, th I think there's a place for both, uh, and we try, to, we try to game things as much as we can without inconveniencing the school, uh, and, and that's, that's the real challenge sometimes uh, is you know, how much time is available and how much chaos can we create or, well, you know, this would be a passive video. I, I, I'm sorry? This would be a passive video, unlike I, some of the others. Absolutely. <laughs> I, I, will, I will continue to research that and get Thank back you. to you. Thank you, officer. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Say hello to Thank mom. You. I will. She always speaks of you. <laughs> <laughs> Our next topic is uh, energy, Cape and Vineyard Electric Cooperative. I had a PowerPoint, but I wanted to give you something so you can take notes and follow along. You see there's two of them. Because we really are talking about two separate projects. I'll get my name on that. <coughs> I'll pass it to you. Where would the, cl the our, um, clicker? To, uh, sure, that'd be great, Katie. So my name is Liz Argo, and I. Oh yeah, you guys can't see anything. That's you just read follow along. No, no, I. I uh, okay. Uh, I am the Cape and Vineyard Electric Cooperative Special Projects 